in your own approach to uh, peace building and reconciliation, are there particular individuals who've uh, inspired you? I go back, first of all, to my days as a young man in Uganda when I was in my late 20s, early 30s, working in the midst of a most bloody coup. It was awful. And in the midst of that situation, I, as a, a, a lay worker with the Church of Uganda, saw my colleagues witness remarkably uh, to their faith. And it wasn't just w witnessing to an abstract faith, you know, a belief in a God up there. What they were witnessing to was a faith that respected the dignity of people, respected their humanity, respected their human rights. Um, not some airy-fairy pie in the sky when you die. Something that was really concrete and were willing to die for that. As many of them did die. These are ordinary African people, but they have at their heart that essential humanity. And that's the point about religion. So much religion drives me crazy. It really does at times. I have to admit that. When I was in captivity, one thing captivity does for you, it uh, enables you to think through things and to reduce them to something that is very simple. I used to think to myself, my goodness, I look at the major religions of the world, Christianity, Islam, Hinduism, whatever, what have you, the lot. It's rather like going into a Victorian parlor. You go in and you look around and it's absolutely full of junk. You know, you've got pictures, you've got macassars, you've got furniture, you can't stand up without tripping over something. Rather like the churches or the religions. They've accumulated so much over the years, so many dogmas and doctrines and essential elements that they consider to be essential elements of belief that you can't see the wood for the trees. And I used to say to myself in captivity, well, I need to cut through that. And I got to a point, and this may sound totally and utterly simplistic to you. It is, really, in some ways. I used to say in the face of my captors, you have the power to break my body, and you've tried, because I was tortured. You have the power to bend my mind, and you've tried, because I was interrogated. But my soul is not yours to possess. In other words, there's a part of me that lay in the hand of God, and no matter if never I was killed, it wouldn't be taken away. Now, you can argue, of course, ultra-simplistic, too simplistic, but in a situation of extremity and crisis, that's where it lay. That was the essential bit for me at that point. I'm not dismissing other elements. I'm not dismissing the necessity for frameworks. I'm not dismissing the necessity for doctrine and so on and so forth. But when it comes to the real heart of it, you know, there lies, at least for me at that time, that's where it lay. And perhaps, you know, that's one of the good lessons I got from captivity, which in later life, in the last few years, I retain my membership of the Anglican Church, but I'm also now a Quaker, a member of the Society of Friends, who whom I respect, and I respect for many things, not least because they have learned something that some of our ranting preachers would do well to get hold of, and that is how to use silence constructively together. And perhaps sometimes in today's world, we could also learn in peacemaking how to make constructive use of silence. Thank you.